All right, if we could turn, please, to the book of Joel, the book of Joel, and I'm going to read chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. As we uh, begin this study together, we want to think particularly about an introduction to the book, and then kind of the theme of the first part of the book is the theme of barrenness. So introduction and barrenness. And so beginning in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the cankerworm eaten. And that which the cankerworm hath left, hath the cat caterpillar eaten. Awake ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests, how ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land unto the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. And God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So as we consider Joel, I want to begin with just getting an understanding of the man's name. Uh, his name means Jehovah is God. And it's kind of like a a short confession of faith. It's like the New Testament, uh, they had their confession, Jesus is Lord. Well, uh, this is a an, an Old Testament confession of faith that is now used as this man's name. And of course, uh, Jehovah is God is the name. Very opposite of Elijah. Uh, Elijah, who ministered to the, uh, the, the northern kingdom, uh, his name means God is Jehovah. Whereas Joel, who ministered in the southern kingdom, uh, Jehovah is God. Now, when it comes to the book of Joel, one of the great difficulties we have in studying the book of Joel is trying to identify when the book was written. Uh, normally, it's not a difficult task when it comes to the prophets. And of course, the reason is, if you look back to Hosea chapter one, for instance, you will find that uh, it, it tells us, Hosea 1 verse 1, the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri. And then it says this, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And so it's very easy to place Hosea's prophecy because of the kings that reigned in Judah and Israel at that time. But when you read the book of Joel, you will not find any king mentioned. And that makes the difficult the task very difficult. In fact, uh, Bible commentators are very divided 
on where exactly to put Joel. Uh, some tried uh, would give an early date. Uh, in, in fact, would say that Joel is the first of the writing prophets. Now, I'm not the first of the prophets. Elijah and Elisha were some of the first of the prophets. But uh, what we mean is the first of the writing prophets, prophets that actually left behind them uh, something in written form. And so the thinking is that Joel actually is the first of the writing prophets. Others would take a view that it's a late date after the exile, when they're back in the land, after the Babylonian captivity and the temple is rebuilt and functioning. And so some would even put it later than even Malachi. And so how do we discern when this book was actually written? How do we come up with a, a definite kind of understanding of that? That we said that because no king is mentioned, uh, that's why people assume that it must have been written after the captivity, because when they came back from Babylon, they never uh, again had a king uh, until, <clears throat> uh, of course, then they had the false kings of Herod and, of course, the true king who they rejected. But, th but no king is mentioned uh, when it comes to the post-captivity era. And, and so, again, it's placed even later than Malachi by some. However, there was a time in Judah's history where there wasn't a king prior to captivity. And it was when there was a wicked queen, Athaliah, who reigned. And, uh, of course, Joash, uh, who was the rightful king, she'd killed all her grandchildren, but uh, thankfully... Uh, in the mercy of God, Joash had been spared and uh, was still a minor. Uh, Jehoiada was kind of the administrator. And, and so there are many that believe that the, the placing of the book of Joel is actually in that time when Athaliah reigned just prior to the crowning uh, of Joash king, which would put it approximately 835 B.C., which again would make it the first of the writing prophets. And so the judgment that is described here uh, would come towards the end of that six years uh, of uh, ungodliness under Queen Athaliah. And so the thought is, no wonder the Lord brought this heavy judgment because of Athaliah's wickedness. Now, some of the reasons why we would favor, at least I would favor, the early date, and I'd like to, to give uh, some of the reasoning why the early date seems to be more accurate than the late date. I'm going to give you several reasons. Firstly, uh, it's more realistic because the enemies that are mentioned in the book of Joel are the earlier enemies. And so, for instance, if you look at chapter 3, we have verse 4, Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and the coasts of Palestine? And so, again, the enemies, the old enemies of, of uh, the Phoenicians, Tyre and Sidon, for instance. Uh, there we have them mentioned, verse 19, another enemies that are mentioned. It says, Egypt shall be desolation, Edom shall be desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah. So again, it's all the old enemies that are mentioned. Uh, the, uh, the the coast of, of Israel, Philistines, uh, the, the Edomites, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians. None of the enemies that we tend to think of in terms of the time of the captivity and no mention whatsoever of Babylon or Assyria. In fact, uh, the thought would be that Joel actually lived before these nations, Babylon and Assyria, rose to any prominence at all. And because of the absence of those uh, being mentioned, the thought is that this is the earlier date for the book of Joel. Also, there's an, an allusion in Joel to a victory that took place under King Jehoshaphat. Uh, notice in chapter 3, verse 2, he says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, 
uh, whom they have scattered among the nations and part in my land. Now, this is a future prophecy, but he refers to this valley of Jehoshaphat. Well, it's interesting that Jehoshaphat's victory in this valley, which was called the Valley of Berechiah, uh, would have been very fresh in the memory of Jehoiada and his contemporaries. In fact, that victory uh, of Jehoshaphat occurred 40 years previously. And so, again, would give us an early date. And again, where do we find that? Let's just look at Second Chronicles uh, chapter 20, uh, where Jehoshaphat's great victory. And of course, that's a wonderful chapter uh, where they come out against a massive enemy. And what do they do? Well, they do something rather unlikely. They praise the Lord uh, as they go into battle and they their their eyes are upon the Lord and the Lord gives them a great victory. And Second Chronicles 20 verse 26 talks about this valley. It says on the fourth day, they assemble themselves in the valley of Berechiah for there they bless the Lord. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the valley of Berechiah unto this day. And they returned every man of Judah. So this was this valley that that was at that time the Valley of Berechiah. Now it's known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat because it was the scene of this great victory. And again, it's still in recent memory. And so that would again give us an early date. Another reason for giving Joel an early date is that other prophets who were relatively early quote from Joel. So I'll give you an example. Joel 3 verse 16 Joel chapter 3, verse 16, it says, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heaven and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and strength of the children of Israel. And if you notice in the book of Amos, right across on the next page, Amos chapter 1, verse 2, it said, He said, the Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. And so it would seem that Amos, the prophet who prophesied in the northern kingdom, is quoting directly from Joel about the Lord roaring out of Zion. And so, again, we have no difficulty dating Amos's prophecy uh, he reign, uh, He prophesied, and again we see it in verse 1 uh, of Amos, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So uh, we know that Joel must predate Jeroboam and Uzziah, must predate them. And so they reigned 790 to 739 BC uh, was it was Uzziah uh, and then Jeroboam 793 to 753. So again, we would say that the evidence for an early date is very strong. Another piece of evidence for an early date is its placing in both the Hebrew canon and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And in both of these uh, writings, of course, they're, they're part of the 12, which is the, the, the books of what we call the minor prophets. In both cases, Joel is in the first part of the prophecies uh, named uh, and uh, not placed later on with the post-exilic prophets. Remember, we get to the end of the minor prophets and we get Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi. They're all the post-captivity prophets. He is right at the beginning, uh, right after Hosea, uh, we have him mentioned in the early uh, group of the 12. And so it seems to me that the evidence overwhelmingly points to an early date probably during the last days of the reign of quick queen, wicked queen Athaliah, that these events that are described took place and that Joel took up his pen and began to write. Now, another, just an interesting observation is that the location of the events is very clear, that this is all in the Southern Kingdom. Clearly, Jerusalem and Judah uh, are in view for the events that are described here. Uh, in fact, um, Zion, uh, which again, we think of Mount Zion, we think of Jerusalem, 
uh, is mentioned frequently in the book. And I want to just quickly run through it and just see how many times Joel mentions this as if this is the neighborhood where these events are taking place. And so he says in, for instance, chapter two, verse one, blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. Chapter two, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call the solemn assembly. Verse 32 of chapter 2, it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Also chapter 3 and verse 1, again, for behold in those days and at that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, again, further down, verse chapter 3, verse 16, we've already referred to it in a different context, but it says, The Lord also shall roar, roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. So again, we've got this reference to Zion. Verse 17, So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. Verse 18, Again, it shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. And then verse 20 and 21, again, Judah shall dwell forever, Jerusalem from generation to generation, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So very evidently, the focus of this prophecy is Zion, is Jerusalem, uh, is the holy mountain of God. It's, it's all focused in that area. And it would seem that Joel... We know very little about him, but we see it seems that he lived very closely in proximity, proximity to Mount Zion. He describes the temple services. Some even thought he might have been a priest, although there's, he seem, seems to be speaking more as an observer than a participant. Uh, but he certainly uh, is very close to all these events. So he cl clearly lives in the city of Jerusalem and he's writing about events that are affecting this place. Also, another just a general observation before we get to dive into the text, and, and this general observation is this, that three times, once in each chapter, God refers to the land, and he refers to it as my land, which is very relevant when we think of the day we're in and all the, the dispute over uh, whether Israel are interlopers, whether they have any rights to the land. And nobody's asking the question, well, who actually owns the land in the first place? And the scripture tells us very clearly who owns the land and he gives it to who he chooses. And so, for instance, chapter one, verse six, for a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Chapter two, verse 18. Remember every chapter a reference to his land. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Chapter three, verse two, I will also gather all nations, will bring them down in the valley of Jehoshaphat, will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land, dividing up his land. Interesting. So very relevant to, to the day we find ourselves in. Uh, isn't it good to recognize who owns the land? The Lord owns the land. It's his land. And he gives it to who he chooses. Well, who did he give it to? He gave it to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Scripture is absolutely clear about that. He gave that land to them. And so when we look at the book of Joel, the events that we are seeing describe, described in the book is a natural disaster, a plague of locusts that comes through the land and that left the land stripped bare of everything green. And Joel does a phenomenal job 
of describing this event. In fact, uh, just so graphic his descriptions. For instance, look at verse three of chapter two. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. And you get that picture, don't you, that with this army of locusts in front of them, it's like the Garden of Eden. But once they've passed through behind them, it's like a wilderness. They just literally devour everything in their wake. And so that's the, 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 the event that he's describing, this natural disaster. And what Joel is going to do, he's going to use local things to teach lasting things. He's going to take this incident and then use it to describe a coming invasion of the land uh, not of locusts but of all the nations that are going to come against jerusalem this what we call the battle of armageddon interesting that joel has been rightly called both the prophet of pentecost and the prophet of armageddon <laughs> he actually alludes to both events which is really interesting and so uh, using local things to teach lasting things, using current events as a basis of reminding them of coming events. And I guess it's easy to do that today, isn't it? We, we look at current events and it's a picture of coming events. It's telling us what's coming. Others were, were definitely affected by the natural disaster, but it seems that only Joel could read the spiritual meaning and indicate the moral responsibility involved. And so uh, in some ways you could say he was like the men of Issachar. He knew the times and he knew how to act. Others were in the same situation, but didn't get it. They didn't see it with such clarity as this man. And so he was enabled by prophetic inspiration to read the future in the present. He could see beyond the external into the eschatological. He could see these things. And what he's seeing is this local event of this locust invasion is a picture of what's to come. When the nations who are on a collision course with God will culminate in the Valley of Jehoshaphat in what we call Armageddon. And what the day of the Lord will really be fulfilled where the Lord will directly intervene and destroy these nations. And certainly Joel is the first prophet to introduce us to this idea of the day of the Lord. We're going to be thinking a lot about the day of the Lord uh, as we consider the book of Joel. In fact, again, it's mentioned, I think, five times in the book. And maybe it'd be good for us just to take a minute to look at those references. Uh, chapter 1, verse 15, alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Uh, chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Again, chapter 2, verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. And then the final reference, chapter 3, verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And so one of the things that we're going to be learning a lot about in the book of Joel is the day of the Lord, what will culminate in Armageddon and very things that we've seen in Revelation uh, chapter 19, all predicted 835 BC before Christ, 835 years before the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, uh, this prophet was able to see these things as he's moved by the Holy Spirit. So Joel's prophecy is not so much looking back to history as looking forward to destiny. The historical events are of significance in that they are forecasts of futures yet to come. 
and they beckon us to look forward rather than backwards. Now, the central verse of the book is kind of interesting as you look at this book. There are 73 verses. And so they divide into two halves of 36. And the 37th, which is the central verse, is chapter 2, verse 17. And chapter 2, verse 17 says this, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is thy God? And so the central verse is actually a, a message of repentance, calling the people, the priests, the ministers of the Lord, to come and cry to God to spare his people. And what's interesting is that prior to verse 17 of chapter 2, it really is a message of judgment. From chapter 2 after verse 17, God begins to bring blessing. He begins to restore the years the locusts have eaten. But everything hinges on this repentance, this call to repentance, a solemn assembly to come together and to repent. And everything hinges on genuine repentance. One of the things that is very evident in scripture is the link between the land of Israel and the people of Israel. It's a very strong link. And God is the owner of the land, but he has given it out to tenants, to the nation of Israel. And so if you look at verse 9 and 10, you, you see this link between the land and the people. It's so evident. The meat offering, this is chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, the meat offering, the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth. For the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. And so the thought is this, that even their worship required the land to be in good condition. Their, their very offerings were agricultural, the meal offering, the drink offering. And so when the land was healthy, their worship was enabled. When the land was barren, it was even difficult for them to worship God. And, and so this land, in a sense, became a very public, palpable token of how their relationship with the Lord was developing. You know, God had given to them, you remember, as they came into this land, uh, how was it described? It was described as a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, when they sent spies into the land, remember, they came back with this this bunch of grapes that took two men to carry with a stave through it. Such was the productivity, the fruitfulness of the land. And, and yet the, the simple principle is this, that when they were in rebellion against, in, against God, the land generally became barren. When they were in harmony with God, it was fruitful. And if we look back to the book of Deuteronomy, and when they entered into covenant with God, we again see this idea of the land <clears throat> and its condition uh, being a reflection of their either whether they were walking in harmony with God or whether they were out of fellowship with God. And so verse 38 of Deuteronomy 28, he says, Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shall gather but little in for the locusts shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the book of Joel. So clearly, this was happening because they were not fulfilling their covenant relationship with God. They were experiencing the curses of Deuteronomy 28 and not the blessings when this book is written. And so a sinful people resulted in a barren land. And of course, sadly, as you look at their history, so often the land was barren because they were away from God. So just to outline the book, this is how we're going to deal with this book. 
So chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 11, we're going to deal with the topic of barrenness. And we're going to see how barren the land had become. And then from chapter 2, verse 12, down to verse 17, we're going to look at brokenness. What is the response the Lord wants from his people when things are barren? He wants to bring them to brokenness. And so there's a call from verse 12 onwards down to verse 17 to brokenness. When they respond to God in brokenness, from chapter 2, verse 18, all the way to the end of the book, we move from brokenness to blessing. And we might put it this way, because although the application that we're going to make is very much a spiritual application, but it's still true nevertheless that I think it's it's real to say that many of us are living in days of spiritual barrenness. Very little fruit for God in terms of our assembly testimony, a lot of declension, a lot of departure, a lot of withering away of testimony. And it seems like we're living in days of barrenness. How do we get from days of barrenness to days of blessing? We must go through the valley of brokenness if we want to pass from barrenness to blessing. There's no shortcut. You have to go through the valley of brokenness if you want to come out into the side of blessing. And that's what Israel had to learn or Judah had to learn. They had to learn that lesson. God is using this invasion of locusts to get their attention, to bring them to a place of brokenness so they might enter into a time of blessing. And maybe that's what's needed in some of our assemblies. Maybe we've just never, uh, we've never got to that place. Maybe we need to call a solemn assembly. <laughs> Maybe there needs to be a time of weeping and mourning in the presence of God because of the barrenness and crying out to him to bring blessing. So with that introduction, let's begin to look at the, the book itself. And so verse one, it says this, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. So this um, introduction, very, very brief. We, again, we know very little biographical information on Joel. His name, as we've said, means Jehovah is God. And it's a very common name. In fact, as far as we're aware, there are at least 14 Joels in the Old Testament. So it's, it's, a, it's a name that was... Again, it was a confession of faith. Jehovah is God. And so it was very popular. And so he shares his name with many others. The only family information available upon this man is this, that his father was called Pethuel. That distinguishes him from the other 14 Joels in the book. <laughs> and again, we don't get a lot of help from Pethuel because it's the only time Pethuel is mentioned in the Old Testament is right here. The possible meaning of his name, hard to determine, but many believe it means sincerity of God. So here's a, a sincere man in a time of barrenness. He has a son. And he calls the son a name that is a confession of faith, Jehovah is God. He believes that Jehovah is God, despite the, the difficulty, despite the barrenness. And so that's the only family information we know. We said already the frequent references to Jerusalem in the temple services in the book would justify the conclusion that Joel lived in the environs of the capital city of Judah. He spoke exclusively to the southern kingdom of judah without addressing the northern kingdom at all and what we know of him is this he did not originate this far-reaching prophecy of israel it came directly from the heart of god notice what it says the word of the lord that came to joel this message came to him from heaven. This was a message that God revealed to his prophet. 
And so it comes to him from, from out of eternity, from God's throne on high, the word of the Lord comes to Joel. And that's his claim to be heard. We don't know anything about his pedigree, his social status, his place of residence or his employment. Uh, all we know is this. He is a man that God spoke to. The word of the Lord had come to him. And really, isn't that what we need today? Men who clearly have a message from God. They may not have a pedigree. They may not have, I've just, while I've been down here, I've been reading and been thrilled to read the biography of D.L. Moody. And he was a nobody. And God shook Europe through the preaching of a nobody. I just love how God does that. God's message came to him, and he went everywhere preaching it with zeal and simplicity and no pedigree whatsoever, butchered the English language, and yet mightily used of God. And so what we could say is this. Here's Joel. We don't know anything about his pedigree, but we know that he had a message from God. It burned in him, and he gave that message. And so he has a claim to be heard because he is a message from God. He, that was the need of the hour. In his times, no less than today, there's a need of men who have a message for this generation. And so often these prophets, they breathe new life into the nation by messages that come with truth, addressing the, the moment with hope, reality, and power. And so uh, they spoke into a situation of, of need and of failure and gave God's message for that moment. And that's exactly what Joel is going to do. What he's telling us is this. This locust plague was more than a natural disaster. There's a divine dimension to the tragedy. And the people needed to have that meaning explained and interpreted to them. They need to know what this is all about. And so in verse 2, he calls for a hearing. And notice his emphasis on this. Hear this, ye old men. Give ear, all you that in, in, the inhabitants of the land. Despite the state of national emergency created by the severe conditions, there was a strong possibility that people could miss the real meaning of this locust invasion. It was a visitation from the Lord. They needed to recognize that the locusts were being directed by the hand of God. It was calculated as a wake-up call to the, to the nation at this particular moment uh, to the, and to tell them that there's greater calamities on the way. This is a foreshadowing of a greater disaster that would come upon them. Now, it is interesting. We've already looked at that passage in Deuteronomy 28 where God had given the cursings, and of course, one of the cursings for their failure to keep the covenant, for their disobedience to the Mosaic covenant, was that God would send locusts, and they'd carry much seed out and bring little back. Well, certainly that is happening. But also, back in the book of Exodus chapter 10, God had also used a plague of locusts uh, in uh, as a wake-up call to Egypt. And so we just, we'll just read a couple of verses from chapter 10 of Exodus. The Lord said, verse 12, unto Moses, Exodus 10, verse 12, stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land of all that day and all that night, and when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts went all over the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them, there were no such locusts as they, neither after them, shall be such. And of course, we, we know the rest of the story. It was part of God's chastisement upon Egypt. But now here's a tragedy. The very locusts that once tormented the Egyptians were now tormenting the people of Judah. <laughs> the land of Judah was under a locust invasion. And uh, that's a calamity that should have got their attention. 
And so his first job is to get their attention. And he says, hear, give ear. And it's essential to get people's attention. We, we've got to get people to listen. These locusts were the rod of the Lord to lead them to repentance. And so notice how he begins. He says, ye old men, give ear. Now, it's interesting because uh, the, the thought is that these old men were really the elders of Israel. Uh, how do we get that? Well, he uses the same term in verse 14, and it's exactly the same word. He says, sanctify ye fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Here he's using the very same word here. Hear this, ye old men, give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. And so he initially begins by speaking to the elders, wants to get the elders' attention, wants them to listen. They're representatives of the nation. Perhaps part of the reason this locust plague is coming is because of the failure of the elders. But it's not just addressed to them. It's also the appeal is not just to the leaders of the people, but to all the inhabitants of the land. If the elders have no ear for God's word, how can others be expected to pay attention? Their position was one which carried a tremendous responsibility with it. And so, and we would say today, the elders in the church of God, they also have tremendous responsibility. And they need to be men that pay attention to God's word. As do all the saints, just as all the inhabitants of the land who needed to take the message seriously, none is exempt from this solemn responsibility to hear God's word, God's word, both in Joel's day and now. And isn't it interesting, though, that the Lord, as he wrote, it wrote to the seven churches of Revelation that we studied not too long ago, one of the one of the resounding repetitions was this. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And of course, we have to ask the question, do we have ears to hear? What is God saying to us? Notice too, uh, as God speaks to them, he, he says uh, again in verse two, hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? In other words, we might say today, have you ever seen the like of it? Obviously, this wasn't just a run-of-the-mill locust plague. This was something that was unique. There'd never been anything this severe before. Just like in Israel, in Egypt. Remember he said there'd never been anything like it before in Egypt. Well, there's never been anything like this in the land of Judah before. And so he says, have you ever seen the like of it? Have you ever witnessed anything like this? Yes, locust invasions were common enough in the ancient East, but here was something unprecedented unparalleled in the nation's memory for generation past and to come. It was one of those things that had to be told. And so notice he says, tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and the children another generation. It's one of those things that 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 this the this event should be the message of it should be passed on from one generation to another, uh, even down to four generations. Tell your children about it. The times were so remarkable, difficult uh, times that parents would tell their children, I lived through the plagues of locusts in the days of Joel the prophet. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? There are some events that we've witnessed in our lifetime that we could say, I remember exactly where I was on 9-11. <laughs> I remember I remember the lockdowns of 2020 and the COVID-19 thing, right? I mean, these are things we'll probably tell to our children and our children's children. They're, they're events that stand out. And there's been certain events in, in history like that that have stood out to people. Well, this was one of those 9-11 type events. This was one of those COVID-19 lockdown events that People had never seen anything like it. Now, I want to just read a couple of reports just to give us a sense of a locust plague. Uh, so the first one, uh, this comes from a commentary by James Montgomery Boyce, and he talks about 
a in 1915 a devastating plague of locusts covered what is modern day Israel and Syria. The first swarms came in March in clouds so thick they blocked out the sun. The female female locusts immediately began to lay eggs, hundred at a time. Witnesses said that in one square yard, there was as many as 65,000 to 75,000 eggs. In a few weeks, they hatched, and the young locusts resembled large ants. They couldn't yet fly and move by hopping. They marched 400 to 600 feet a day, 122 to 183 meters a day, devouring every speck of vegetation along the way. After two more stages of molting, they became adults which could fly and the devastation continued. That was in 1915 in what is Israel and Syria. Here's a, an eyewitness account of one such invasion in the American Great Plains in the 1870s. And this is very descriptive. They, the locusts, typically descended without warning in a ravenous horde out of a bright summer sky. As they got nearer, their faint buzzing built up to a, terrifone, a terrifying cyclonic-like roar. One German farmer, hearing a swarm approach, fell to his knees and shouted, Der Jungstag, Judgment Day. He thought Judgment Day was coming. In the space of a few minutes, they blocked out the sun, noticeably lowering the temperatures. Grasshopper swarms resembled snowstorms with insects seeming to fall out of the sky as far upward as the eye could see. When they began to feed, the crunching of, an, of millions upon millions of tiny jaws sounded like a prairie fire. A crawling lair several inches thick carpeted the ground and covered every growing thing. When the hoppers moved on, the area they left behind looked as if it had been burned to the ground. Grasshoppers liked grain and garden produce the best, but they would eat any sort of vegetation from grass to weeds, to buried roots and bulbs, to the bark, leaves and branches of trees, which they sometimes broke off by their sheer weight. Nor did they stop with living plants, straw hats, the binding on shocks of grain and tobacco were all devoured, as were wooden items, tool handles, window frames, fence planks, even paper and fabrics, clothing, bedclothes, mosquito netting, canvas, leather too, was considered tasty. Harnesses, the sweatband of a hat, a wallet, along with the currency inside it, old boots. One settler saw a swarm eating wool off the back of a live sheep. And when everything else had been consumed, the grasshoppers ate each other. That's quite a description. Joel feels it would be a great tragedy if the lessons of this calamity were lost, not just to this generation, but to a generation yet unborn. And so it had to be passed on from one generation to another. By the way, it's it's good, isn't it? We're, one of the things we want to do is reach multiple generations. We want to see the, the message of God, not just reach this generation, but their children and their children's children and their children's children. And we long for that. And so we should desire that, that God's message not be a one generation thing, but it reach other generations. He wanted them to learn the lesson from the past. You know, the famous historical statement, those who do not learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. If they don't learn the lesson of this locust plague, there may come another one. And so they had to learn it. And so we, we see verse four, where we finally get the identity of this unprecedented crisis. And so it says, that which the palmer worm, worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. So there's this repetition of this phrase, that which hath left. And it gives a dramatic picture of, you know, what one group don't eat, the next group eats. And what that group don't eat, the next group eats. And what that group don't eat, the next group eats. And so basically, 
everything is devoured, systematically stripping the land of everything that is there to be seen. Now, there's four, um, there's three different views as to these four descriptions here: canker worm, uh, the cat, the palmer worm, uh, the locust, the canker worm, and uh, the caterpillar. Um, some think we have four different insects uh, that are being mentioned here. Uh, others think that there are four different stages of the growth of a locust from one to another. Now, the difficulty with the four different stages view is if you look at chapter 2, verse 25, these four are mentioned again, but they're not mentioned in the same order. I will restore to you, verse uh, chapter 2, 25, the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm. So if it was in a specific order of their stages of growth, uh, why would he use the same list of names but put them in a different order? Perhaps the view most to be commended is one uh, that uh, didn't understand the four nouns to denote four specific species or even stage of development, but the activity of the the locus. And so the New King James translates it this, the chewing locus, the swarming locus, the crawling locus, the consuming locus. And so it's just really talking about the activity and habits of locusts at any stage or species. Some of them are chewing, some of them are swarming, some of them are crawling, some of them are consuming. But whatever the, the end result is, they're all destroying the land. In fact, in Hebrew, there are nine different words used for locusts. And so that's why we can't say there's four different types of locusts here, because it's really hard to distinguish. There's nine different types of locusts mentioned. One thing for sure is this type of tragedy would grip the imagination of children who would listen to the story of the devastation. Their eyes would be wide as they would hear about this kind of thing taking place. And so by way of application, and there's a lot to learn here. First of all, elders need to learn as well as listen. He's got a message for the elders, but he also has a message for the entirety of the people of God, the whole of the nation. And one of the messages we need to listen we, we need to not only be apt to teach, but also apt to, to hear, to, to be slow. Uh, sometimes we're slow to learn. We need to be apt to hear what God is saying. While the locusts in this chapter are must be interpreted literally and not allegorically, there is the possibility that we could apply this to the Lord's people today. You see, we, we have to come to terms with the fact that many assemblies are going through times of spiritual barrenness. And we might ask the question, what are the locusts that are eating up our spiritual productivity for God? Is it materialism, the locust of materialism that's eating up our productivity and fruitfulness? Is it, is it the locust of pride that is devastating our usefulness for God? Is it strife amongst the saints? That certainly brings great dearth and barrenness. Is it gossip in the assembly that's causing uh, this dearth? What is causing the dearth uh, in our current assembly state? Whatever it is, we need to be brought to brokenness if we want to move on from barrenness. Whatever, whatever's causing the current state of barrenness, we need to come before God, get honest in his presence. We need a time of genuine brokenness before we can move on to a time of unprecedented blessing. And that's the goal. And that's, I think, the entire message of Joel in one session, although there's much more we can learn. But may God encourage us with these things. Amen.